Well, we're on our way to Flagstaff. Yes, the pedal to the metal and the thing to the floor and what? Yeah. Off we go. Off we go. <laughs> we better hurry or we'll be late. We're, we, we can't be late. We're going to the southwest region of the NMRA convention in Flagstaff. And it's fairly imperative that we get there because, well, we're the guest speakers. That's right. So, anyway, we just thought we'd show you uh, our guest speaker thing deal. Yes. So here it is. And we're off. And we're off. We're, uh, we're, or we're not off, but... Uh, are we on? I think... Hello. Hello? <laughs> is that working now? Is this one? Is this one? Up and close and personal. Up and close and personal with the microphone. So eight, eight years ago, mm -hmm. uh, we were here. Closer to the mic. Closer to the mic. Okay. Yeah, better. <laughs> eight years ago, we were here, and I, I did a little speech. I wanted to present the, the 10 things you can do to improve your modeling. Unfortunately, I could only come up with eight, but uh, it seemed close enough. And uh, one... <laughs> One of, the, one of the ideas, and somebody pointed it out earlier, like last night, one of the ideas was if everything's going right, it's time to turn left. <laughs> so there's always something you can do to reimagine what you're doing and go off in some new direction. And uh, I have found that in my own life, quite often taking off in a new direction, whether it's completely tearing your railroad apart and starting over a new scale, which many people have done, or just whatever. But um, some years ago, I came to the horrifying conclusion that uh, at retirement, I was either going to be doing the exact same thing that I was doing, or I was going to be doing something else. And while that's rather binary, it also seemed completely unacceptable. Because I loved what I was doing, but I also knew it was a complete dead end. And I was teaching at a university, and uh, I thought I, I need to, to branch out. I need to go off in a new direction. What happened was it led to the three best days of my life. Some four years later, I was accepted at a, at a school that I really wanted to teach at, Brooks Institute. I would call that the third best day of my life. The second best day of my life was when I was invited into the president's office and she asked me to leave the employment and go find something new to do. <laughs> and uh, at the time I was horrified. I mean, nobody wants to be laid off, especially from the best job that they've ever had. The reality is that they were having financial difficulties and I got out just in the nick of time. And because of that, I met my wife, and, <laughs> and that, that leads to the best day of my life, the day we got married. <laughs> now, before I left to go off teaching in other places, while I was still at the University of Utah, I'd been making train videos. I don't know if you've seen any of those. They were called Madame Wu Video. And, um, so when I left, I wasn't able to do Madame Wu video, but oddly enough, the technology that I was distributing on also went away, and that was called VHS. <laughs> so that met a demise, and there again, it's one of those strange turns to the left that you didn't quite expect, and I sort of thought I'd be able to sell VHS tapes for the rest of my life and continue shooting in this format called video for the rest of my life and have access to high-end equipment for the rest of my life. Instead, I found myself out in the cold. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but time marches on and new technologies came along. And uh, by the time I was at Brooks Institute, uh, I wanted to start producing videos again, but not necessarily video, it was digital. Moreover, uh, I was no longer chasing trains around, nor did I have a model railroad or uh, any, anything going on in that venue. So I started uh, running around with a bunch of friends and we built hot rods. Specifically, we were building race cars, which was also something that I'd been doing forever. Right. And uh, anyway, so at that point, we need to sort of back history up just a bit and start this video and hopefully this will work out well. <laughs> so far the technology hasn't quite, 
But I want the technique that we use when we're making these videos is we go out with, with our cell phones and we have some other cameras, but principally we just use our cell phones because that's the beauty of digital cinema is cell phones take the best video of any camera we own. We shoot everything, we bring it home, put it into the computer and throw away everything that doesn't belong in the piece. And then I add in music and some sound effects. And then we just sit down in front of the computer, turn on a microphone and narrate it after the fact. So we're going to attempt to do that live as it's happening. What could possibly go oh. wrong? Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> so we've taken some bits and pieces from other shows and some of this early footage, uh, some of which has found its way onto the channel and some not, uh, just to sort of show this, this evolution all the way from uh, discovering digital video all the way through to a YouTube channel, all the way through to chasing some trains around and in fact meeting each other right. and so on. So without further ado, I'm going to start this and then let's just hope it works. Let's hope it works. So this is, this is me in one of uh, the Mustangs, the Mustang I had at the time, the blue Mustang. And this was part of what I was doing. I was running around filming everything I could in my car, filming with my friends as well. And we all had Mustangs. And we all drove like complete lunatics. However, I will say not on the road. We went to the racetrack to do that. I had no idea what I was gonna do with any of this footage. I was just shooting it because it seemed like it would be fun. This is Billy Johnson. This is, of course, me driving around like a complete lunatic in the white Mustang. And this is Billy Johnson again, and he took his semi out to see if he could get around the track in a, in a reasonable amount of time. I posted this to something called the internet. I had no idea that such technology existed at the time. Of course, it had existed forever and it got 30,000 views because it was funny. And I realized that a bunch of lunatics driving around in Mustangs, nobody was all that interested in, but some crazy person driving around in a semi-truck was funny. All this time I was still working at Brooks Institute of Photography teaching and I had access to, to students to help with this and access to video equipment to do it with. But as I say, that, that was about to come to an end. This is the Ratfink reunion, which is a car show in Manti, Utah. And I'd wanted to attend this, and so I at no longer working at Brooks Institute, I was able finally to attend the Rat Fink reunion in Manti. This is one of Ed Roth. I don't know how many people are familiar with Ed Big Daddy Roth, but this is one of his cars. He lived in Manti. And so after his passing, all of his friends and family put on this amazing car show which led me to yet another turn in the road. Exactly, this is where I come in. Uh, I go to the Rat Fink reunion every year because I'm from there. And uh, that's how I met Dale. Uh, he was right over there by the tent. Uh, I went over to see if something was for sale and this gentleman was trying to sell me this uh, chair, I thought. Well, it ends up being Dale, and I didn't realize that till after we had met, but old Rat Fink was quite the Cupid and brought the two of us together. Too loud? A little too loud. <laughs> A little too loud, okay. More, more. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> more. <laughs> lower, lower. Lower, lower. There it is. There it is. Woo! So, on my YouTube channel, I decided to put this up for Rat Fink this year, and I videoed the mural. And so I put it on my YouTube channel, and my channel got connected with this other channel. I had no idea who it was. It's Toy Man Television. 
So I decided to watch his videos, and the rest is history. Yeah, we started, uh, we started following each other on the internet without having any idea who we were, except that we were two different YouTube channels that went to the Rat Fink reunion, and that we liked hot rods. And pretty soon, we started filming together, and instead of me driving around in the Mustang, it was both of us driving around in the Mustang. This is yet another Rat Fink reunion, this time with us together in the Red Mustang. That was a lot of fun. Anyway, this, is, uh, this was uh, my friend's uh, car. He was best man at our wedding, and we ended up with his car, so then we had another Mustang to deal with. And so we took this to the Rat Fink reunion, and we would take uh, all three of the different Mustangs around to different events. In this particular case, however, we're heading out to Ely, Nevada, to the Nevada Northern. I'd been going out to the Nevada Northern forever, ever since they, uh, the Kennecott Mines turned that railroad over to the people of Ely, and they turned that into a museum. And so the two of us started also frequenting the Nevada Northern Railroad. It's a stark wilderness out there. I don't know how many of you have been to Nevada Northern. It's about 120 miles from anything. This was interesting. This is a Ford Tri-Motor. <laughs> now, we were at home one day, and the telephone rings. I say the telephone rings. Hello? <laughs> it was my brother. <laughs> a Ford Tri-Motor just flew over my house. Next thing we know, we're on said Ford Tri-Motor going for a ride. I made a couple of phone calls to see why a Ford Tri-Motor was flying over my brother's house, found out that they were giving rides out of an airport near his house, and off we went. Right. Somebody had told me we was getting up that morning riding a Ford Tri-Motor. I wouldn't have believed it. It's sort of like a, a Model T, except that it flies. <laughs> we hope. We hope. <laughs> But we were just absolutely flabbergasted at what a wonderful time this was, and just the spontaneity of being able to go out and fly in an airplane unknown to each other. And then we started finding people with unusual hobbies. This is Gary Young, and he and his friends decided to take up full contact jousting. <laughs> and they were promoting that as an Olympic event. The idea being, <clears throat> just as in all full contact jousting, take your lance and knock the other person off their horse. <laughs> and they would ride back and forth. Gary spent a fortune building this jousting arena on his farm. And they would go out there and they would joust and see who could knock who off uh, who the other person's horse. This is Gary taking a lance to the head. He came conscious about 10 minutes later. He's okay. He's okay. <laughs> he claimed he was unscathed and got back onto his horse to the adulation of the 30 or 40 people who were there. <laughs> Needless to say, people with very unusual hobbies usually have to have a budget for doing that. I can't even imagine what Gary spent on all of this. Speaking of which, this is uh, Jasper and uh, Marion Sanfilippo. I don't know how many of you know uh, the Sanfilippos of Chicago. Jasper loves steam engines, static typically, but any kind of steam engine. This is their living room. <laughs> I think when we were there, they had something like 150 different static steam engines in the house. Fortunately, it's a 40,000 square foot house, so they could fit a lot of them in there. <laughs> this is a, a separate building they call the Carousel Building, and that is a European clock tower that he dismantled and brought back to Chicago with him.
He also decided to build a complete power plant out in the carousel building and then filled that with even more static steam engines. All of these run. Everything in the collection, everything in the collection is perfectly restored and fully operational. They run all the steam engines on compressed air, in part because steam is very difficult to deal with and in other parts because the neighbors don't like him to fire up his boiler. <laughs> the reason they call this the carousel building is because there's a carousel which also runs on steam. <laughs> this, is the, uh, this is us enjoying a day on the carousel. We were invited out there as a fundraiser to raise money to restore a shea, which they have at the Illinois Railway Museum. And so he put together a fundraiser and opened his house for people to come in and throw some dollars in the hat to restore the shea. Other than that, of course, it was just their private residence and no one was allowed in there. And what good steam collection wouldn't also include a steam locomotive? This is an 1880 Grant 440, and he built a complete uh, standard gauge railroad. It was only about 600 feet long. Something like that. Um, and again, he never ran it. He just liked having all of this stuff. But he did have about 600 feet of track and two cars, one of which is a caboose. And this happens to be one of my favorite cars is a caboose. So this is my living quarters. If I had my dream, this would be my away house, my she shed, if you will. And of course, uh, check out the inside of this caboose. You know, it's every woman's dream, in my opinion, right? Has all the amenities. This would be my home. It doesn't quite fit the expression crummy. <laughs> But uh, if you're going to build a caboose from the ground up, I guess you can build it any way you want. And then, of course, there's a fully restored Victorian passenger car as well. All of this, of course, in the carousel building. Also in the carousel building are about 30 carousel organs. The main pipe organ is back in the main house and is the second largest pipe, uh, theater pipe organ in the world. People and their hobbies. <laughs> On to model railroads. This is Tom Hawley of Grand Junction. And uh, typical of some of these very large model railroads has approximately one mile of track. So about 87 scale miles of track on the railroad. But the thing that really impressed me with this railroad is he had the idea, he, he didn't want to use any DCC because he couldn't get enough current out of it. And the reason he couldn't get enough current out of it is he wanted to run everything at scale weight. So you take the, the scale of, that you're working in, in this case HO, you have to cube that, so 87 times 87 times 87, divide that by the weight of the actual car, and then weight the car appropriately. So each of these flat cars weighed in at a quarter of a pound. Which, is a pr which means that this, this train weighs 25 pounds. <laughs> so you're spinning drivers, you have to add in more locomotives, then you're breaking knuckle couplers, so you have to put in mid-train helpers and a rear helper at the back end to keep the, it's just exactly like actual railroading when you're trying to do these scale uh, weights. The maximum grade here was just under 1%, and to hear those locomotives, Atherin locomotives, just straining, trying to get up a 1% grade, hauling a 25-pound 25 train. <laughs> those steel coils are actually solid metal, turned on the lathe into steel coils, but it was the only way he could achieve the weight that he wanted from the car, <laughs> was to load those, those steel coils, or actual steel coils.
And of course, it wouldn't make any sense to run such a thing if you didn't run scale lengths. <laughs> so these are typically 100, 100 car trains, something like that. <laughs> You can see why DCC wouldn't really work out. With all that uh, multiple unit, you would think that he would definitely need. This is uh, Jim Harper. He is totally into accurate scale, not so much scale weight, but he does, he models in uh, Proto 48, if you're familiar with Proto 48. But he and his friends created Proto 48 many, many years ago and he has built this railroad to the most accurate scales he possibly could, mostly being just obsessed with the equipment, particularly the locomotives and the track. And seeing this railroad, it's in St. George, Utah, but just the phenomenal detail in these brass locomotives and, uh, and then the track work is what really really blew me away. A lot of people will say, well, with Proto 48, then the gauge is correct, but it's just so much more than, than that. So it's not the full one and a quarter inches that you would normally find in O scale. It's just, it's down to the proper four feet, eight and a half inches in 48 scale. But then all of the flanges and wheel profiles have to be correct as well. But look at the, the detail. This is all scratch built. He made all of his own patterns for frogs, guardrails, cast those into brass. Everything here is 100% uh, scratch built. When I saw this, this track, I was ready to take another left turn. <laughs> Went home and abandoned everything I had done started casting tie plates and frogs and guardrails and went to work trying to duplicate what he has done here only in 120th scale, which is a lot simpler to do than in 148th scale. <laughs> he has this electrified railroad here, the Sacramento Northern part of his same railroad. Every axle is powered with an individual traction motor just to keep it accurate again. He's modeling Donner Pass, Southern Pacific from Sacramento up to Donner Summit. I don't think he's taken it all the way to the summit, but up, up onto Donner Pass at least. And in spite of the fact that the flanges on these wheels are barely visible, I've never seen a derailment on this railroad either. He and his friends, after they came up with the proper wheel profiles and found someone to CNC the wheels and so on, they started mass producing these and selling them because of Proto 48 did take off within a very narrow group of people who are into that kind of fanaticism. And this is Ralph. Right. <laughs> <laughs> a friend and neighbor, and uh, we are very lucky to call Ralph friend and neighbor, but uh, Ralph has built this railroad, and it was built in, in uh, the late 1960s, and he's modified it somewhat over the years, but he's into automation and animation. This is his fully functional uh, coaling tower for his engine facility. So you attach the tow to the mine coal, the mine run coal, which he brought over from the mine. The mine tipple is fully functional. You load the coal into the car, attach the car to the tow, and then you just simply press a button and the rest is fully automated as it pulls the, the coal load up the ramp to the coaling tower. 
where it is emptied into the coaling tower and then returns the empty back to the train. This thing never malfunctioned. It was built in about 1969. I don't think he's ever had it apart, and I've never known it to malfunction or derail or anything. It's just a testament to getting that correct. Being old school, whenever he hits a switch, there's a tremendous clacking sound of the solenoids underneath switching the tracks and even rerouting the power and so on. There's no plastic anywhere on the railroad. It's all metal of some kind, typically brass. <laughs> this lovely little automated mine here. <laughs> Look very closely as this shovel empties actual granular material from the quarry into the car. It passes directly through the car to below where it's recycled back around to the chute which fills the shovel and it just sits and runs like that. And watch the chain going around on the sprockets and so on. And this is Ralph's brass collection. I think he has the finest brass collection that I've ever heard of, yet alone seen. These are Tenshodo big boys. Years ago, back in the 1950s, he fell in love with the Tenshodo big boy and set about buying one example of every variation on the Tenshodo big boy. This is an interesting model here. His friends uh, were some of the best modelers. Most of them have passed now. And they decided they wanted to build the Blue Goose. Each of them was assigned a job. Ralph did all of the casting work and uh, lost wax casting. They did all of the machining. One of them did the painting. There were seven of them on the project. They built seven of these and each of them took one. And that's how these seven blue gooses, completely scratch built by these seven individuals. And then they decided to do the ACE 2000. I don't know if you're familiar with the ACE 2000. It was supposed to be the steam locomotive for the 21st century. Kind of an odd concept there. But when, when the designs for the ACE 2000 came out, they said, let's build seven of those as well. Notice it has side rods and everything. It's a, Steam locomotive with a condenser, but it's still a side rod steam locomotive. And these are his turbines, his 8,500 horsepower turbines. These are all united. Uh, yeah, united, as I recall. Anyway, what makes them unique is these same seven individuals did all of the pattern work for the united uh, turbines, the 8,500 horsepower turbines. They did all of the machining and pattern work. Ralph did all of the casting, only in this case he made enough castings for 1500 or whatever the production run was going to be. They sent all of the castings to Japan for assembly. And then the first, uh, I believe it was 15 locomotives to come back from Japan were sent to Ralph as payment for the work that he did on this. And he saved, uh, I think, two examples of each one. But these are, these are the, the pattern models for all of those turbines. But I think his, his favorite passion is still figuring out these little tiny pulleys and, and mechanisms to animate all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. 
All of the control functions here are now from DCC. He has joined the 21st century in that regard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm impressed enough seeing one of these working in real life without seeing one operating in HO scale. But you just never know, all of these people, everybody brings a little something different to the hobby. Whether it's building a plywood locomotive in your backyard, complete with train station, <laughs> or whatever oddball thing that everybody manages to come up with. He's spinning the drivers there. Yeah. <laughs> and this person decided to model the Disneyland Railroad in his backyard. <laughs> and if you're going to do a Hot Wheels track, you might as well get serious about doing a Hot Wheels track with HO Railroad. <laughs> Uh. <laughs> and speaking of Hot Wheels, <laughs> anyway, we, we haven't abandoned the idea of doing automobiles. We, we do everything. That's right. <laughs> we're, we're all across the board, and, and uh, where we chase a lot of trains, we're still heading out to the car shows and racetracks, and... Uh, We've only added to never and never taken, taken away. away. I don't know how to uh, escape from this. There, we are. there it is. <laughs> Ta-da! Ta well, I hope that wasn't boring. <laughs> we we have the advantage when we're doing this at home that when we screw up, we can just back up and start over again. Which is often. Which is often. <laughs> <laughs> or even go back and re-edit the video. Yeah. So it's a little more challenging doing it live this way. Great. Well, thank you. I, I, I hope you enjoyed it. We try not to be boring. That's the motto of the show. The high art of screwing around. And we hope you didn't find it boring. And look for the subscribe right. button. Yes. And look for the subscribe button. But it's blue. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I, I can't believe we do it, but we managed to put up a show every Sunday and every Tuesday. Right. Yeah. <laughs>